Oh, good afternoon, everybody. Sorry, I'm running just a few minutes late getting started here. Last crept up on me. Okay. So I, I get to working on something else. I think, oh, I'll just work on that for 10 minutes. And then 20 minutes later, I'm like, oh. Ah, and then Zoom is installing updates on the other computer. <laughs> Outstanding. Well, we'll let that go for a few minutes. I don't need that right away anyways. All right, so today is Thursday, October 12th. Uh, today is the 16th class of our semester. Um, I haven't uh, considered office hours next week. Uh, I'll probably have office hours on Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, I have an exam in my other class, my steel design class, and so given that exam is on Wednesday afternoon, I'll probably have the office hours on Tuesday and Wednesday so that students can come in and ask questions about that before that exam. Um, I'll post those over the weekend and then we'll we'll go from there. All right, uh, let's see, looking at our schedule for uh, next week and such, uh, we're gonna talk about cardinal points and frame modeling today. Next week, we'll continue talking about frame modeling on Tuesday. And then on uh, Thursday of next week, uh, we have a guest lecturer coming in. I won't be available to teach class live. And instead of recording something for you guys to watch, I thought I would get uh, Maggie to come in and give a couple of demonstrations. Uh, she does a lot of work with a program called Tecla Structural Designer. And uh, so she's gonna start off with a little, um, just a demo of what that is. Uh, Tecla Structural Designer is an alternative to the packages that we're using here. It's probably closer to SAP 2000 than it is visual analysis. Uh, uh, we're not going to do any work with it, but uh, since I have the day available, I thought she she could give you just a little demo of what it is, and and maybe that would pique your interest, or maybe you work with it in one of your jobs or something like that. Um, it's available in theory to everybody on UC uh, campus to use. We have site licenses for it. I haven't embraced it for this class because, well, first off, I'm much more familiar with SAP 2000 than I am with uh, Tecla stuff. So it would be a lot of work for me to transition this class over to working with Tecla instead of uh, uh, SAP 2000. And uh, second, I think that SAP 2000 is more or less the industry standard in, with respect to, to structural modeling packages. Now, if you ask a dozen engineers, you'll probably get six different or eight different answers, but uh, I believe that to be true. So that's why I haven't uh, uh, done anything with it formally in the class, and I don't plan to. Um, the second thing she's going to do is uh, give you an introduction to um, eTabs. And eTabs is basically the same analysis engine of SAP 2000. It just has a fancy uh, user interface that's tailored towards um, vertical construction, towards building construction. And we're going to move in. We're going to we're going to transition into a discussion of frames uh, from our discussion of beams and trusses. And so. Uh, we'll use SAF 2000 to do uh, two-dimensional modeling of frames and maybe some rudimentary three-dimensional modeling. But when it comes to modeling buildings, then uh, eTabs is uh, clearly the, the way to go with that respect. And so she'll give you an introductory uh, um, demonstration on what eTabs is and how to use it. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about it on Tuesday. But uh, you know, if you want to position yourself where you're in a computer lab to work along with her with respect to eTabs, that's, uh, that's certainly possible. 
Uh, we only have 10 licenses of ETABs, whereas we have, I think, 30 licenses for SAP 2000. So with a class like this, we should be fine. There's seven of you and uh, one of me or one of her. So that's eight. But if there happens to be a couple of grad students around campus using ETABs for their graduate work, then uh, that might create uh, some issues with the licensing. It's not usually a problem, but uh, if it's not unheard of for you to try and launch ETABs and find that all 10 licenses are taken, and then you have to wait until somebody's done. And then, yeah. All right, um, let's see what else we have here. Um, I did some grading uh, with homework number two. I went through and I graded that uh, this morning. I uh, use the word graded uh, somewhat loosely. I basically look through each of the assignments to, to make sure that you, you've more or less done what I've asked and I uh, provided some um, rather topical commentary to it. Um, one of the more common issues that I saw was that several of you copied and pasted uh, bending moment diagrams from SAP 2000 into your solution. Uh, and uh, I would encourage you to make sure that the bending moment diagrams uh, conform to the U.S. standard, the U.S. convention, where you have a positive bending moment for uh, when the top fiber is in compression. Not a big deal at all. Uh, and maybe uh, maybe you're working uh, to the, the standard that you're used to from uh, previous work or whatever. But if you're going to hand off a bending moment diagram to somebody in the U.S., it's probably best to uh, either have a really good understanding with the person you're communicating with or uh, conform to, to the U.S. Uh, conventions there. Another uh, issue that I saw quite often was uh, issue of numerical precision. Um, I saw two different extremes there. Uh, one extreme where there was insufficient precision where somebody would report a displacement out to one significant figure. Um, we could do better than that. Uh, but on the other hand, if you provide 8, 10, 12, 15 significant uh, digits, that's probably not great either. That's probably a lesser sin, uh, but still, um, you know, uh, having what, eight significant figures of precision, I guess seven is what I'm showing there, that uh, implies a level of accuracy that we just don't have. Um, yes, the computers are probably that accurate, but on the other hand, the data that we put into the computers is probably not that accurate. So uh, it would be irresponsible to suggest that our analyses is any more accurate than the data we put into it. Again, not a big deal, but uh, just something to, to bear in mind. If you go out on your first job and <laughs> report displacements out to seven significant figures, your your uh, boss will probably laugh at you, but that's okay. Um, here's our homeworks uh, Whoops, that are still pending. Uh, I noticed an ambiguity uh, when I was looking over things this morning. I had uh, homework number six listed on this slide in the past as due on Friday, but then October 18th, and October 18th is actually a Wednesday. And then when it was on Canvas, it was due this Friday, tomorrow, October 13th. And so what I did is I left homework number five where it, where it is. It's due tomorrow at five o'clock. But I moved the due date for homework number six to Monday at five o'clock. And uh, I noticed that nobody had turned in homework number six yet. And only a couple of people had turned in homework number five. Uh, I'd spoken to a couple of you who indicated that you were struggling with uh, respect to time on that. So uh, moving homework number six to, uh, to Monday will give you the weekend to work on that. Um, I also posted the uh, spreadsheet today. That's so This is the wrong class. I posted the spreadsheet that I've been using for beam analysis on Canvas as well. So if we go to the course content page and scroll down to the last class, here it is. It's an XLS file, and that's the, well, it's not exactly the file I've been using in class, but I, 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 I deleted some garbage out of that and then posted a cleaner version of it. So this is uh, hopefully will help you with homework number six. All right, so on our agenda for today uh, is to discuss uh, a little bit more about matrix analysis of beams and then move into our discussion of cardinal points and then frame modeling. And so what I wanted to do was uh, uh, revisit that beam that we were looking at on Tuesday. We looked at it in the context of SAP 2000 and um, visual analysis. I wanted to look at it in the context of matrix analysis. And so we started to look at this example um, a couple of classes ago uh, where we had the center point load. 
We modeled it using three nodes. We came up with our uh, stiffness matrix for that. And then we uh, applied our equivalent end actions and then uh, came up with our load matrix and did our analysis. What I wanted to do was uh, expand on that a little bit and show what happens when we model this uh, beam with two loads instead. And so I've got three different versions of the same um, uh, um, matrix model. And the first one is where I use just two nodes to model the beam. And so with two nodes, I'm gonna have four degrees of freedom, one element stiffness matrix, and I have the uh, four degrees of freedom that are shown there. So degrees of freedom one and three are restrained. And so the advantage of this approach with only two nodes is that I have a smaller uh, problem size to solve. It's only gonna be a two by two uh, free free stiffness matrix. So you could actually invert that just using equations, right? Uh, what is I forget the crisscrossed on the on that matrix. But uh, the um, um, the uh, downside to this is that now I need to use equivalent end actions for both of the load cases. I need equivalent end actions for the distributed load on the left and for the two point loads on the right. So if we look at that distributed load, the uh, equivalent end actions that I come up with uh, are shown here. So I have N shears of 15.6 kips, and then I have uh, end moments uh, of 811.2 kip inches. If I look at the point loads, um, using um, this uh, uh, set of equivalent end actions, uh, we have uh, equivalent end moments that are equal to 1,063 kip inches. And then the equivalent end shears uh, by symmetry, you could say that they're equal to 16 kips each. So, um, you know, this is a good exercise in, in uh, calculating equivalent end actions because that's not a trivial part. In fact, now that you're used to the matrix analysis and the inversion process, this might be the most challenging part of these problems is coming up with the equivalent end actions that you're going to use. Then um, the second option is to model that same beam using three nodes. And using three nodes with one point load for the live was simple because that live load was a nodal load. But now when we use three nodes and we have two point loads for our live load, we again end up having to use equivalent end actions for both the dead load on the left and for the live load on the right. And so, the uh, matrix assembly process is familiar to you, so I won't show that, but the uh, determination of the equivalent end actions is still a little bit tricky. So when we figure out what the equivalent end actions are for the distributed load, it's the same as what we had for the, uh, the first version of the problem. Uh, we end up with uh, N shears of 7.8 kips, and we end up with equivalent end moments of 202.8 kips due to the distributed load. When we look at the live loads, then this bit gets to be just a little bit trickier because the uh, live loads aren't in the center of our elements. They're actually offset uh, three feet to the right of center. And uh, well, I guess it's a foot and a half to the right of center in each case. And so we have to be a little bit careful when we determine our end shears and our end moments. And so um, I guess I could have been a little bit more specific this is the equivalent end shear for the left-hand end. This is the equivalent end shear for the right-hand end. This is the equivalent end shear for the left-hand end and for the right-hand end. And this is the left, and then this is the right. And then it's flip-flopped over here because of uh, the, the symmetry that exists in the structure. And so we calculate the equivalent shears, uh, 5.28 kips and 10.72 kips, and then the equivalent moments, uh, 227.2 two kip inches and then 363.6 kip inches. And so um, uh, that's kind of an in-between solution. It gives you the worst of both worlds. You have a larger stiffness matrix and you have uh, more work to do on your equivalent end actions. And then the, uh, the last case that I considered was a case where we modeled the beam using four nodes. Um, in this case, uh, the nodes aren't equally spaced over the length of the beam. Instead, I put the nodes underneath the point loads, um, which makes a lot of sense because then we can model those as nodal loads instead of as uh, member loads. And so when we look at our equivalent end actions, they get a little bit more complicated for the distributed load, where we have 4.8 kips uh, of equivalent uh, end shears for the uh, elements A and C. 76.8 uh, kip inches for equivalent end moments for elements A and C, 
Then we have six kips for an equivalent end shear for element B, and then 120 kip inches for an equivalent end moment for element B. And then when we go and look at the point loads that are applied to this model, the 16 kip loads coincide with a uh, node, so we can apply those as nodal loads. If you wanted to, you could still apply these as equivalent end actions. Um, and uh, the way that that would work, I'll have to sketch it in because I, I didn't uh, prepare a drawing, but you would have a, a beam like this where you have uh, some load um, here, let's call that uh, P. And then we have our dimensions. So this is going to be uh, A here on the left. This is going to be B on the right. And this is going to be the length L. And so we can come in with our equivalent end moments, call that ML, call that MR. And what you could uh, say is that M sub L is equal to P, uh, forgive me, is it P? Uh, yeah, PAB squared divided by L squared. And in this case, B is equal to zero. So that's equal to P times A times zero squared divided by L squared, and that's equal to zero, right? And so you could apply that as a member load if you wanted to, where it's at the right end of the member, technically not at the node. And then you could do the same thing for the right moment. So then P uh, A squared times B divided by L uh, squared, and then you would have P times zero times B, and that would be equal to zero. And then we could solve for the equivalent shears. Uh, let me sketch those in. You would have a shear here on the left end and a shear here on the right end. And ultimately what you would end up with is VL is equal to zero, but V sub R is equal to P. And so you could come up with a set of equivalent end actions, uh, applying those uh, forces as member forces that would be equivalent to the nodal loads. I'm not sure if there's an advantage to that. Maybe you have a, some aversion to uh, applying loads to the nodes for some reason. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe that work, makes the matrix uh, stuff work out cleaner so that everything is an equivalent end action as opposed to having nodal loads in the model, but that would work out. So um, yeah, so uh, determining equivalent end actions is often one of the more challenging parts of these problems. And uh, so there's a, a little bit more to, to go on uh, for that. All right, uh, our next topic for discussion then is going to be cardinal points. And I posted this presentation on Tuesday, but we didn't get to it. So let's go ahead and dive in right now. <laughs> Uh, excuse me. All right. So um, like everything else that we're dealing with, um, this discussion deals with features in the finite element software that go by different names in different packages. And in fact, even in SAP 2000, it's kind of confusing because uh, in, in some, um, in my opinion, we could use one word to describe all three of these things, but they, for whatever reason, decide to use this terminology instead. And then in visual analysis, it's called something else entirely. But basically, what we're talking about is how the member is located within the model. And so um, by default, in SAP 2000, the local one axis runs along the centroidal axis of the member. So when we define a uh, pair of nodes and then draw a member between those two nodes, we're identifying the member by its centroid, the location of its centroid. Now, this comes uh, important sometimes because when we look at the way buildings are laid out, we often define the geometry by different locations. Maybe we identify the geometry at the top of steel at each level instead of at the centroid. So if that was the case, if you're given that the top of steel is at elevation 880 feet, for example, then you would have to do one of two things if you're going to model it correctly. You would either have to subtract half the depth of the members that you're using for your model uh, from the location of that floor, or you would have to adjust the insertion point or the cardinal point so that instead of having the, uh, the model define the centroidal location of the members you're using, that the model instead defines the top of steel location instead. Not all programs have this feature. Uh, I suppose most modern ones do, 
Um, but it's usually easier to uh, change the cardinal point and then use the original geometry of the structure. But there are some perils. There are some ramifications to that decision. Um, right. So uh, there are a set of predefined locations within the section called cardinal points that can be used for this purpose. So uh, you can also offset the cardinal point from a joint by setting a joint offset as well. And so this becomes uh, important if you want the member, maybe you don't want two members to line up right at their uh, um, theoretical working point, maybe you want an offset. And this is uh, not uncommon when you're looking at edge girders in a building or edge beams in a building where you need to uh, shift them over a little bit to accommodate the envelope uh, connecting into the structure or something of that nature. So the total offset from the joint uh, to the centroid is given as the sum of the joint offset plus the distance from the cardinal point to the centroid. And these offsets uh, work together with the cardinal points to identify an insertion point for each of the members. So you can adjust that uh, by using the assign frame and then insertion points command. And when you do that, it uh, gives you a drop down box that's uh, shown up here that allows you to define where it is you want the uh, member to find that. By default, it's uh, at point number 10, which is the centroid. And then you also have the offsets that are included here as well. So you have the ith end and then the jth end of each member. And then you can define an offset uh, relative to the local one, local two, local three axis, or you can come in here to this drop down box and specify the global degrees of freedom instead. So then you're looking at the X, Y, and Z directions instead of the local one, two, and three directions. Um, right, and so if we uh, were to look at the different cardinal points that are available to us, here are the 11 cardinal points that we have. So if you wanted to define your model such that the steel was uh, uh, defined at the top of steel instead of at the centroid, then you could specify cardinal point number eight. So it'd be the top center of each of the members as opposed to the centroid of each of the members. And so there are uh, 11 different options, basically each of the four faces and then each of the four corners. And then there's uh, one, two, three that all appear to be at the same, five, number five, number 10, and number 11. So the middle center is the middle geometry of geometric portion of that center. Um, so if you uh, go in and take, uh, let's switch colors here. Uh, maybe you have an angle that you're using instead of an eye shape. And so in this case, uh, point number five for the middle center uh, is basically going to allow us to define a box around this member like this. And then so the geometric center of that box is going to be point number five. All right, number 10 is the centroid. And so for the centroid of this guy, that might be over here. And so that would be point number 10. And then for the shear center of this, uh, some of you probably don't know what a shear center is yet, but some of you do, of course, the shear center would lie back here. And so that would be the shear center. It just so happens that for the I-shaped section that they're using to illustrate that the, uh, the middle center, the centroid, and the shear center are all at the same point. And that's just uh, an unfortunate coincidence, I guess, for this particular case. So one example for using these insertion points or cardinal points would be to look at the columns that could be in a structure. And so I don't think that too many people would do this, but let's suppose you have a W8 by 24 column in an upper level and it's framing into a W36 by 150 column at the lower level. Yeah, that's a big difference. It's not a realistic uh, situation, but it works pretty good to illustrate the point that I want to make. So um, if you have those aligned along uh, their centroidal axes, then they'll appear like this in the model, both geometrically and analytically. But if this were an edge column in a structure, you might want to uh, specify them such that maybe one of the two flanges uh, was at a common uh, plane, maybe that so that they're all lined up along this edge here. And that way, when you bolt your facade or weld your facade to the structure, you have a common plane to work with. And so you could specify insertion point eight instead of insertion point 10. And what it does is it aligns those uh, uh, members up uh, such that they're working at their top center location. And so you would end up with this as your model. Now, if we go in and, and look at uh, two different uh, SAP models with uh, both of these options, 
Here's the first case where we have insertion point number 10. Here's the second point where we have insertion point number eight. One thing to bear in mind though, is that when we put our point load of 100 kips on there, that's now going to create an internal moment in those members because now that load is applied eccentrically. That load is applied at the top center of those members as opposed to the centroid, uh, centroidal axis of the members. And so what you end up with is a bending moment that's basically equal to the axial force multiplied times the eccentricity that exists between insertion point number eight and insertion point number 10 or insertion point number eight and the centroid. So for the W8, that's roughly eight inches deep. So you take 100 kips times four and you end up with basically 40 kip inches of moment. If you take the W36, that's basically 36 inches deep. So you figure half of 36 is what, 18. So you take 100 kips times 18 inches, you end up with 180 kip inches a moment. And so that's uh, where you get those bending moments that are shown there, except they're shown in kip feet instead of kip inches. So um, that's one consequence of that. And yeah, here's the calculations. I forgot that they were in here. So you take half the depth of the W8 by 24, you take half the depth of the W36 uh, uh, by 150, and then you get those bending moments. Okay, now if we shift gears for a minute, we'll come back to SAP 2000. But if we go to visual analysis and look at the similar feature that's there, then they're called member offsets. And so, um, you have uh, offsets uh, in the Y direction and in the Z direction relative to the local coordinates of our uh, elements or our members. And so you could create the same situation there where you can define either at the um, centroidal axis or in this case, I can offset them by half the depth of the beam and uh, locate them at uh, uh, 17.95 inches with respect to the bottom. Now, one thing, uh, if memory serves with respect to visual analysis, is that it doesn't offer the same uh, level of convenience. I can't just say top of steel or bottom of steel. I actually have to put in a number there. And so that's where the 17.95 inches comes in. I have to actually look up the depth of the 36 by 150 and then have it and then uh, put it in manually, which is a little less convenient. Another interesting aspect associated with visual analysis is that if I go in now and look at the bending moment diagram for the second case, a bending moment diagram shows no bending moment at all. And so that's interesting, right? So when visual analysis moves that member over, moves those members over using the end offset, it doesn't change the formulation associated with those members. It's really just a cosmetic change. It's just showing it differently in the model. It doesn't actually change anything in the calculations that are associated with that change in the model. Um, maybe that's good. Maybe that's what you had in mind. Um, maybe not. Um, so, but the, one of the weaknesses of visual analysis is that I'm not sure you can get visual analysis to change the way it's doing the analysis to accommodate the eccentricity that would exist in that model. If we go back to the SAP 2000 interface, there's actually a checkbox here that says, do not transform the frame stiffness for offsets from the centroid. And if you check that box and then go back and redo the analysis, what you'll find is that there is no bending moment in those members now. And by checking that box in SAP 2000, you basically indicated that you want that uh, to be a cosmetic change and not an, an analytical change. And so you might want, you might ask, well, why would you ever want to just make that as a cosmetic change? Well, one answer to that is maybe you have some type of an automatic interface between SAP 2000 and a building information model. Maybe you have some type of a bridge, an analytical bridge working between Revit and SAP 2000. And in Revit, those members are, are located with their offsets, but you've decided as the engineer that you don't want to include that in your analysis. And so that gives you the option of, of indicating that within your model. All right. So, um, if we look at uh, insertion points, sometimes the neutral axis of the element cannot be conveniently located by joints that connect to other elements. The insertion point consists of a cardinal point plus the independent joint offset. And it's generally recommended offsets due to insertion points be perpendicular to the axis of the element, although this is not required. 
So if we go back and look at this dialogue, the uh, joint offsets that it's recommending should be a local two or a local three offset. And what SAP is saying is they recommend you not use a local one offset. That will actually shorten or lengthen the member. And uh, I think that they are worried that odd things might happen in their analysis when you do that. There is an option for that, and that's what's coming up soon. It's called a rigid end, uh, rigid end connection. Um, right. So here's where we would use those uh, join offsets, though. And so we have the same connection shown in, on the left as we do on the right. So we have the elevation view shown on the left, and we have a plan view shown on the right. So this uh, would be better if I had like a 3D model of it, but I don't. So uh, we'll just have to live with this. So basically, if you look down on this from the top, then that's what you see over here on the right. So this column right here is the same as this column that's uh, shown here in section. And so this is that case that I was describing earlier where um, this is maybe a corner column of a building. And so we want this uh, beam B1 to be shifted over to the left a little bit so that the edge of the flange aligns with the edge of the flange of that column, and then it makes the facade connections easier. Same thing here with this beam B2. We wanted it to be shifted a little bit outside as well so that the edge of its flange uh, lines up with the face of the flange of the column. And so what you could do is specify, uh, in this case, it would be a, a local um, uh, two uh, offset of two inches for both of these. In one case, well, depending on how you have it set up, if this is the ith node for both cases, it would be uh, a negative two inch offset and for one of them, and it would be a, a positive two inch offset for the other one, right? So we're using cardinal point eight in both cases, uh, top of steel, but then we're using an end offset to move that over a little bit relative to, to where the, uh, the axis of the column is. All right, so uh, a little bit more about that. Frame elements are modeled as line elements connected to joints. Um, however, actual structural members have some finite uh, cross-sectional dimensions. When we have two elements, such as a beam and a column, they are connected to a joint, there will be some overlap. Uh, in many structures, you need to account for that uh, with large length or large depth of overlap can be a significant fraction. So let me go back and look at that image that we were just looking at, and then we'll move on to the, the next slide. So in this case, for example, if I go back and illustrate the elements that we're actually drawing in, here's a node, and then we have an element framing out this way, and it stops and it goes on. Here's another uh, element framing out this way, or frame object or elements or whatever. And so what ends up happening is you have this beam B2 that is defined here where it's actually going to overlap with this column. So you have two members that are occupying the same space physically. And you know conservation of space, conservation of mass, you can't have that happen. So let's go to slide number 15 where there's a different uh, illustration of the same thing. So in this case here, the beam would be defined as a frame op frame object or uh, an element that spans between those two nodes. And really the clear length of that beam is something less than the analytical length of that beam. Um, that can make a difference in, in a lot of cases into how stiff the frame is. Maybe, uh, maybe you're looking at a high rise structure, the moment resisting frames, and so if you want to meet drift requirements, maybe you can uh, help by use, uh, recognizing that there's some overlap in those members. And so um, what this is uh, referred to are rigid, uh, rigid offsets or rigid end joints, uh, end offsets in SAP 2000, lots of different words for it. And so um, if we end up with a W14 by 176 for our column sections, a W21 by 44 for our beam sections, the, uh, the columns have a depth of 15.2 inches. So we might have an analytical length of uh, 24 feet, but our uh, columns would actually have a, a physical length uh, much less than that. Instead of 288 inches, we would have 272.3 inches. And so if you go to calculate the deflection of that beam under a gravity load, that can make a difference between 4.4 inches and 3.5 inches. And so it doesn't sound like it's a whole lot of, uh, 
uh, difference in the length of the beam. But when you look at a beam deflection uh, equation like this, where the length is taken to the fourth order, a small change in the length of the beam can result in a significant change in the deflection that you calculate. And so this one results in a 20% uh, increase in stiffness just by recognizing that you have end offsets. So um, this is shown for a steel building. Um, and uh, when you go in and do the same thing for a concrete building, it can be even more appreciable because a lot of times you'll have square or rectangular columns and maybe a square beam framing into it. And the dimensions on those concrete columns and concrete beams can sometimes be larger than the dimensions that we would use for steel columns and steel beams. And so it's equally important there um, when you consider concrete structures. Right, so um, yeah, right there it is. It's even more likely to be significant in concrete than it is in steel. So um, when we were talking about defining cardinal points and insertion points back here on, let's go back to slide 10, there was a cautionary note that said, hey, be careful about defining uh, end offsets in the local one direction. And the reason why is that you can use these rigid end zones instead, or these rigid uh, offsets instead. So instead of changing uh, um, uh, your dimensions of your beam this way, it's recommended that instead you go in and use these uh, end offsets or length offsets instead. And so you can have them defined automatically based on connectivity. And so SAF 2000 is really clever. It can go in and say, okay, he's got a beam element that's a W24 or what, by whatever connecting to W14s. So it actually goes into the database of shapes and looks up the depth of the section, figures out where the insertion point is for the column that's connected, and then subtracts off the distance that you would have from that insertion point to the face of the column that's connected to the beam. And so SAP does a wonderful job of handling that automatically. Um, there are some other parameters that you can put in there as well. You could specify the length of those end offsets uh, directly. Uh, in this case, I had units defined in feet, but you know, if you specify the global units in inches instead, then you can define the end offsets in inches if you want to. There's also something called a rigid um, zone factor. And so the uh, the idea goes something like this. If we go back and look at this uh, as a steel structure, there's uh, a little bit of shear deformation that's assumed to happen in the uh, um, the panel zone of these columns. What is a panel zone? Basically, this uh, rectangle here is a panel zone for the column. So one might look at those as being infinitely rigid, uh, but one also might recognize that, hey, there's some racking deformation, some shear deformation that can occur in these. And so there might not be considered to be entirely rigid. So with that, uh, with that factor that you can define in here, the rigid zone factor, that allows you to model that end overlapping region as something other than infinitely rigid. You're allowed to put something in there to indicate that uh, maybe there's gonna be some panel zone deformation in a steel structure. If it's a concrete structure, then you probably want that zone factor to be equal to one because it probably will be more or less infinitely rigid. But here's, where, here's what that rigid zone factor is. It's something that I forget every time I have to go in and uh, uh, remind myself what it is. It's basically a factor that's applied to the offset length that you're uh, using at each end. So uh, it never affects the axial strength or the torsional deformation, but it does affect the uh, the flexibility of the beam that frames into it. And so that's where that uh, rigid offset factor factor comes in. Okay, uh, yeah, there's a note here, be, uh, use caution when assigning rigid offsets to automatically meshed elements. <laughs> We're gonna end up doing that all the time, but then the problem becomes, does the offset apply to the frame object that we define, or does it apply to the frame elements that SAP creates before it does the, the model? And so there's a, a little bit of ambiguity there. And then here's an illustration of some of that panel zone deformation that you can get uh, out of, uh, of some structures. This is not ideal behavior in a steel structure. Um, you wouldn't necessarily want to see your column behave that way. If, if uh, you were expecting that type of deformation, you would probably reinforce that panel zone by adding a doubler plate or maybe a diagonal stiffener or something like that. But if you want to model that sort of behavior, that's what that rigid zone factor is there for. Okay. Um, 
If we shift over to visual analysis again, here's uh, a model in visual analysis with that W14 by 176 uh, column and the W21 by 44 beam. And if we go in and just model it without a consideration of our rigid uh, end offsets, you can see the members are physically overlapping there when we look at the model in picture view. And the drift that we would get out of that under a 25 kip horizontal load, it's hard to see, but up here there is a uh, force equal to 25 kips. And so we end up with a drift of 0.715 inches. If we go in and model that with our overlapping regions accounted for, so I'm assuming we have a rigid offset in there and it's half the depth of that column. And so now what we've done is we've reduced the drift that we're getting out of that frame by about 10 or 11%. So we get 0.639 inches instead of 0.715 inches. So um, what if we wanna change that from rigid to something else? Well, we can define it as flexible. And then I come in here and put a percent value in, is it 50% flexible? Then I end up with uh, 0.792 instead, which is actually more deformation than what we would get if we didn't put that end offset in at all. So maybe I need something larger than 100. So I come back in and uh, put in 500 instead. And now I get a drift of uh, 0.654 instead. And so these numbers are all kind of uh, hokey. And there's, uh, I have a definition in here of what these uh, percentages are. Um, when rigid visual analysis uses a multiplier of a thousand on the member stiffness to determine the end zone stiffness. So if I wanted half of that, I put in 500 and that's where it came up to 500. Um, right. So, you know, when when should you use these? When should you not use these? Well, it's really up to the engineer of record who's doing the analysis uh, to decide when you need to account for these and when you don't. Um, if you go to the AISC specification, um, the that standard says that you must account for things like panel zone deformation in columns and uh, uh, sources of deformation like that. And so, that might lead you to believe that you should always account for these engine, uh, rigid end off, rigid end zones. But then I've heard other engineers say, you know what? I've thought about it and I'm going to account for the deformation that I get in the panel zone by not including rigid end offsets. And so you just use the theoretical length or the, the, um, um, the line model length of the beam instead of the physical length of the beam and then that makes the beam a little bit more flexible, which is a way of accounting for the panel zone deformations you might get out of the columns. It's kind of a, a waving your hands in the air kind of a, a rationale, but you know this was a this person was a very well respected engineer, and that's what he chose to do for the models that he was discussing when, during that conversation. So that that's fine with me if that's what uh, if that's what the engineer decides to do. So. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, just a way of uh, performing a more, uh, you know, more refined analysis in your model. Um, a lot of what I'm going to do in the class, I'm not going to account for this sort of thing. I'll probably define most of my uh, beam elevations based on the centroidal axis of the member, and then I probably won't use rigid end offsets very often. But I want you to know that it's uh, available to you and uh, that, uh, you know, if you get into a situation where you want to uh, shift things around a little bit, you can do that. And, um, you know, maybe you end up working for somebody that uh, insists on doing this. And, and now you know that these options exist and you can um, modify your model to to account for those types of things. So. All right. Uh, questions you guys might have. All right, then uh, I think what I'll do then is uh, we'll conclude a little bit early again today. And then when we come back on Tuesday, uh, I'm going to start doing some frame modeling. Um, I've got a building that I use as a tutorial. I call it the Tower of Terror. Some of you have probably seen it from different classes that uh, I've presented. And what we're going to do is construct a, a couple of models of that. I'll start off by constructing two-dimensional um two-dimensional models of the moment frames and the brace frames that are in that Tower of Terror. And then we'll conclude by constructing a three-dimensional model of the structure in SAP 2000. And then when we come back on Thursday of next week and Maggie introduces uh, ETABs, 
uh, if she has enough time, then maybe she could construct a three-dimensional model of that building in ETABS as well. And that'll be our conversation point for the next couple of classes. Um, yeah, I'm wishing in hindsight that I had posted material about the Tower of Terror today, and then I could start that now, I guess. But uh, I didn't think I would get through this in, uh, as quickly as I did. And so now I better wait and post the uh, the, the plan sheets for the model and that sort of thing. And we can we can cover that on Tuesday. All right, I'll hang around for a few minutes for questions. Otherwise, uh, our, I'll have office hours uh, Tuesday morning next week, probably at 8.30. Um, and then our next scheduled class will be Tuesday at 12.30 next week. All right, thanks a lot.